Okay, looks like we are at two o'clock, so uh, we will go ahead and get going here. Um, this track is made possible by NC Cardinal and live captioning is made possible by Equinox Open Library Initiative. We'd like to thank the rest of the conference sponsors for making this event possible. They include Mobius, Bibliomation, and Evergreen Indiana. The event is being recorded and will be available on YouTube following the conclusion of the conference. We'd like to encourage everyone to use the chat window to post questions. The facilitators will be collecting your questions along the way and posing them to the presenters at the end of the session. We also would request that you uh, keep yourself muted um, for this session. I don't think this is a round table. No, it's not. So um, we would ask that you keep yourself uh, muted for this session. And we would like to introduce the presenters for this session. Uh, Taryn McKenna and Tiffany Little and Elaine Hardy, who are all from Georgia Pines. And they'll be talking about the OPAC usability study results. With that, I'll turn it over to them. Uh, thank you, Benjamin. Uh, can everybody he hear me okay? Um, I do want to warn you that, uh, as I'm sure many of you are, I am at home. Um, I have a lot of cats and they all just recently came through talking to me. So we may be interrupted, just so you know. Um, I wanna thank everybody for coming today. And uh, as Taryn mentioned in the keynote, um, we really regret that we were unable to host everyone in Atlanta this year, especially since 2020 is the 20th anniversary of the Pines Consortium. We were looking forward to celebrating that with everybody, but we are very thankful we can share, um, virtually share the usability study with you and are grateful to everyone who is responsible for that, including NC Cardinal. Um, okay, for some, Sorry, I accidentally muted myself. Um, <laughs> for some time now, Pine staff have discussed the possibility of a usability study of Evergreen and the Pines OPAC. Um, this year, we were able to facilitate an initial small scale, scale usability study by the School of Engineering at Mercer University. I'm gonna provide a little background on the study and Taryn will discuss the study and its findings and then Tiffany will discuss uh, future uh, steps. Um, as library catalogs have evolved from paper ones only available in-house to computerized only available in-house to web-based ones available wherever the users have been or have the technology to access them, uh, usability has become more important Giving, given that solo user access with no library and um, mitigation to the databases. So, you know, the question is how do we enable and enhance discovery when we're physically distanced from the search? Um, how do we ensure that our ILS assists rather than hinder discovery and present library data and system functionality in a way that benefits rather than frustrates users? The best way to gather answers to these questions is to ask the users about their experiences, navigating our, op navigating our OPACs, and to make positive changes with that feedback. However, we're not always able to be objectively the ones to gather that information, to ask people those questions, and harvest the answers. We often have to depend on outside vendors, which can be kind of costly. Um, since 2006 or so, Pines has done an annual user satisfaction survey. This is not scientific, uh, nor is it really representative of the Pines user population. We post it on the OPAC and it's up to the um, user to click through and answer the questions. Um, but the, those, help, those responses have been helpful in formulating policies and guiding de development, even though they are an incomplete snapshot of the user experiences. Um, more controlled empirical surveys and usability studies have always been on our wish list to provide more information and in making improvements to the design of the online catalog to enhance user navigation and discovery. Um, in addition to user study, usability studies of general users and non-users, remember your non-users are also important. Um, 
because it because gathering information from non-users can help make your um, uh, catalog more accessible to those people who don't use them. But uh, Pines has also been interested in auditing accessibility of Evergreen for users with visual and other differences uh, that might require assistive technology. Uh, we just recently, uh, last year, although it seems like much longer ago than that now, uh, we're able to use a grant to fund a web accessibility evaluation of Evergreen with the Center of Inclusive Design and Innovation at Georgia Institution of Technology. And you just heard um, John Rempel talk about that at the key keynote. Um, the audit uh, was an overview of web accessibility and degree of conformity to those web content accessibility guidelines and the AA success criteria. Um, it was this, you know, we've done an OPAC one earlier. This one was for CERC staff functionality and testing and detailed code testing. Um, it determined that Evergreen was fairly accessible. It had some predominant issues uh, were the lack of labels on form fields and unexpected sounds accompanying actions. And I think any of any time you had your uh, speakers up too loud and you encounter the red, red alert uh, noise, you probably are sympathetic to that, particularly if you've been in a public setting when that has happened to you. Um, we also, we released the final re report to uh, Evergreen community and Tiffany created Launchpad Bugs. And the report is at that uh, link and it includes links to the bug reports. Now, at last year's Georgia Libraries Conference, several of us attended a session on a project to revamp the publicly accessible catalog of research reports held by the Georgia Department of Transportation. One of the presenters was a professor at Mercer University School of Engineering, Department of Technical Communications, and she discussed the usability aspects of the project. After the presentation, uh, we discussed with her the possibility of a usability study of the Pines Evergreen OPAC. She in turn got us in touch with Dr. Pam Brewer, who's the manager of their usability lab and teaches courses in uh, usability studies and testing. Uh, Mercer University is a private university with its main campus in Macon, which is located in the middle of the state, a few hours south of Atlanta, has satellite campuses throughout Georgia, including one neighboring our offices in Atlanta. Unfortunately, the School of Engineering is in Macon and not in the campus next door, so uh, we did uh, webinars and did travel down there um, to see the student presentations. The Department of Technical Communications provides opportunities for students to design and implement real-world studies to enhance products and services for private corporations and federal and state agencies. In discussions with Dr. Brewer, we agreed that an initial study of the Pines Evergreen OPAC would be a good project for her next usability class. In the study, we wanted to look at the experiences of different age groups of library users and non-users. The class was divided into five groups to develop and administer a study based on age and use of the OPAC and the two apps. Uh, Taryn set up test accounts on the live server for the project and a discussion list so that we could answer student questions directly. We, Dr. Brewer set up a webinar with the class to so that we could introduce Pines, ourselves, our expectations for the project, and for us to answer initial questions her students might have. Um, and these are the five groups that, that they wanted them to look at and that they did look at. Um, the initial outcomes that we proposed was to uh, identify concern, confusing terminology and screens and to generate ideas how to make them less confusing. Identify processes that have too many steps and, and could be streamlined. Identify problems users may have using the catalog and identify additional tasks that patrons would like to do within the catalog. Uh, the task for the participants, um, and I want to uh, point out that both this and the processes, uh, given the time limited time that we ha they had for the test, not all the tasks and all of those uh, processes were looked at because of that. Um, so they weren't incorporated into the study. But you know, is it clear what the catalog is for? 
Can you find your closest library? Can you log in? Uh, can you tell whether your local library has a book? Um, search for materials on a topic. Um, you know, just see which library has your book if yours doesn't, where it is, is it currently available? Um, if it's not there, can you place a hold on it? And then also things about navigating uh, the library account, uh, particularly if you can renew uh, what is confusing, can you update your password, things like that. Um, at the end of the project, we traveled to Bacon for a tour of the usability lab, uh, which was in transition from uh, uh, early digital, I guess, to, to current digital is the best way to put it. And uh, we also had a presentation of the study findings by each of the student groups that looked at each of those groups. So now I'm going to turn it over to Taryn to discuss the study and its findings. Okay, let me rest control of the screen away. Let's see. Okay. <clears throat> Zoom keeps giving me little pop-ups over things I need to read. <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, I've um, kind of compiled and summarized the five different sets of results here. So I'm, because a lot of the different age groups had the same feedback. Um, on particular topics or, or areas and pages. Um, so first of all, um, the general reaction of all of the different age groups to the OPAC was positive. They liked the clean, simple design. They, everything was clearly labeled. They liked the ability to check the account status and, and the ability to place holds. Um, the users that used the search filters really liked them. Um, but not everyone actually noticed what they're, that they were even there or understood what they were for. Um, the college age group was the, um, the biggest user of those because they're so used to using online research databases with filters. Um, the age 65 and up group in particular uh, really loved the convenience. Many of the users, um, since we specifically asked for group uh, for users that were not like regular Pines users, so we could get, you know, feedback from people that weren't um, familiar with the catalog and the app already. Um, a lot of the 65 and age, uh, 65 and up age group, um, weren't actually aware that they could access the catalog or manage their account online, and had um, those that were library users thought that they would have to visit the library or to call the placeholds and renew items. So that's more of a um, marketing and, um, you know, promotional type of thing rather than a usability, but they did love the convenience of it. As I mentioned before, the college age group um, was the only one that really used the advanced search options at all. Um, they really liked those though. Um, going through some of the areas where they had some levels of confusion, the hold placement page, um, they, uh, most groups found this page confusing. There are a lot of fields there and they're not really broken up visually in an understandable way. Um, and a lot of users were either using a tablet or a monitor with a large screen or low screen resolution so that the entire form didn't appear on one page. <clears throat> and um, because of that, they were kind of overwhelmed with all of the fields and the layout. Um, and didn't often didn't realize that they had to scroll down to click submit to complete the um, the hold. So some suggestions for that page are to rethink the layout of it to make better use of space, and to con consider dividing it uh, visually into different steps. Where do you want to pick the item up? How do you want to get notified, etc. So that's I think something that's very doable that we can um, discuss as a community to make that process a little more streamlined and clear. The next issue is the library list. Um, Pines has 53 regional library systems and about 300 branches. And I know a lot of other consortiums have a very large number as well. Um, the longer that list is, the more confusing it is. Um, 
a lot of users don't necessarily understand that the libraries are broken up into regional systems. If they do, they don't necessarily know what the regional system name is. They often don't even know what the branch name is. Um, some of them, since they didn't understand the branch selection, had a branch selected but didn't really understand that they weren't searching the entire consortium. So some suggestions on things we could possibly do to resolve that. Um, if they do know the name of the branch or the system, it would be nice to be able to type in the start of that name so that, or our portion of that name, so that they could filter it to the library they're looking for. Also adding some visual emphasis on screen to make it more obvious that they're searching a particular library or, or system rather than the entire consortium. And another suggestion was to, um, if they're searching only a particular branch or system and they're not getting any results or not many results, then make it a little more obvious rather than just a text alert that they could expand the search location to possibly get better results, maybe by highlighting the library location dropdown. Uh, integrating geolocation and mapping would also be really helpful. Um, <clears throat> a lot of users, well, pretty much all the users, even the older users, really expected to see an option, you know, a use my location sort of option um, so that they could, you know, filter the results by their region. Um, they are uh, the Evergreen Community Development Initi Initiative is actually funding a project um, to sort copies by distance um, for, so that they can choose their location and then have it sort all of the um, available copies um, by distance from them. But it would also be useful to have that. Sorry, there's a bug in my face. <laughs> they, um, it would also be useful to have um, that kind of location centric uh, capability right at the basic search level before they do their search. Um, oh, skip the page. Um, okay. So, uh, Pines, they looked at the Pines specific OPAC rather than a, you know, a master OPAC. And we do have a library locator map um, on our site. Uh, it's pretty rudimentary. Um, you have to just type in a zip code and it, it zooms in and shows you the libraries nearest that zip code. Um, so that's, I think, a, kind of a start in the right direction. Um, you know, that's not integrated directly with Evergreen. But if we could build on that idea and integrate something like that on a, a more sophisticated level, I think that would be really useful. Um, they want to be able to just go to the map and see where all of the libraries are and then zoom in. They also want to be able to click a button to say, kind of start here, use my location. Um, and they also want to be able to type in a library name rather than just a location to search the map for that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, also, uh, when they are viewing the map, they want to be able to see all of the library addresses um, in text next to the map, uh, like they would in Google. Um, oh, and the other thing is they wanted to be able to save, you know, once they selected a library, they wanted to be able to set that as their preferred search library, which right now can only be done by going into my account uh, settings. The next um, piece that they were a little confused by was the renewal process. Um, many of them were looking for a renewal button on the same line uh, as, the, as the book. Uh, many of them overlooked the renew selected titles drop down entirely or didn't really understand that they had to select or check the check boxes and then click that button. Um, so because they were ignoring that part, they were looking down here, uh, many of them clicked on the title, expecting that to take them to a renew option, which it did not, of course. It takes them to the um, item details page. <clears throat> and even there, they expected to be able to renew from the item detail page uh, if they had it checked out, because they're used to seeing that type of functionality in common ebook apps. 
Um, so a suggestion, a few suggestions for that. I think it should be, we should be able to add a renew button to, next to each item that has renewals available. Oh, someone else suggested adding the book cover next to each item. Um, and then also adding the renew uh, function from the item detail page uh, if they have it checked out. Another problem area was the pop-ups. And this was one that took all of us at Pines by surprise because we're so used to using the browser all day long every day. We've never, we never really noticed um, the usability uh, issues of the pop-ups ourselves. Uh, but what happens is that the default browser pop-up appears very high on the screen. And this is a screenshot from Chrome, which is worse than it is in Firefox, but I wanted to show the worst example. Um, the pop-up appears very high and it's not visually distinguished from the background. And the text is also very small. So all user groups uh, had trouble noticing that the pop-up was even there. But the older user groups or the users that had bifocals, not only did they not notice it was there, but because it was above their, the line of their bifocal, uh, that made it even more difficult and they had a really hard time reading it that high and because the text was so small. So if we could customize those pop-ups rather than using the browser defaults so that they're pushed down to the middle of the page and are visually stronger, that would help a lot of people. Um, another suggestion um, was uh, they wanted to be able to see um, somewhere, either in the My Account section or in uh, maybe on the footer of the page when they're logged in, the contact information for their home library. Um, right now, it just shows the, uh, what their home library is in the My Account page but I think it should be fairly straightforward to pull in the library's, you know, uh, link to the library's location and their address and hours and everything, either into the footer or to the My Account page or both. Um, one group, the high school age group, um, also were looking for ways that they could, they were looking for the common share button that's standard on a lot of sites because they wanted to be able to share books or baskets or lists or whatever page they were on by clicking a button. And the um, college age group actually uh, requested that, whoops, requested that we added the standard up and down arrows to all of the column headers for the columns that are sortable, which again, that's something I didn't really even notice wasn't there before but should be pretty easy to add. Switching over to the app results. Um, whoops. Um, again, the overall reaction was very positive. Um, they loved the clean, simple layout and the iconography. It was very easy to understand and intuitive for everyone. Um, they liked how easy it was to do all of the basic tasks, like placing holes, renewing items, checking due dates. Um, we had some similar reactions to the basic search that we usually do in the OPAC, um, which the user groups uh, didn't actually, that reviewed the OPAC um, in this study didn't actually mention these in the OPAC, but they did in the app, which I thought was interesting. Um, but they wanted things like autocomplete, search suggestions, spell check, um, things that we all want, <laughs> that all of our users want, um, and that uh, there are some projects to try to get some of those things going in the works, but we're a ways off. Um, the app in particular, uh, they complained about the lack of location, um, both in the OPAC and the app, but in the app, they really assumed that the app knew what their location was and were very confused that it did not. Um, they also wished that it would save the search criteria between the searches, especially for the search location. Um, and that's actually something that uh, Ken Cox, um, the developer, app developer, and I have talked about. So I think we'll bump that up uh, whenever we get some more funding available um, so that they don't have to go back and select the library or the system every single time they do a new search. Um, 
again, the library list is very long. Um, just for fun, I screen capped our 300 branches to see how many pages it would be. <laughs> and there's 12, uh, 12 full pages of libraries um, that they have to go through to find their branch that they're looking for. Um, a few other suggestions. Um, again, they want geolocation. Um, they want, you, you know, whether it's automatic or just to allow app to use my location, some kind of setting that they can control. Um, they want to be able to save the search location and other search criteria between searches. They'd like to be able to set the default search location from there rather than having to go to the My Account settings. And also, you know, possibly add search suggestions of some sort at some point. Um, on the search details page, they expected to see the locations of the books on this page. They didn't really, most of them did not understand what copy info was for. Um, so I think, you know, a suggestion for that would be to move the copy info to this page um, so they could scroll to it instead of clicking on the button. Um, and possibly also, uh, right now the copy info just shows the copies for within their search location. Um, so possibly add a, if they're not searching all of the consortium, then to add a button saying to show copies at other locations as well. Um, the lists, um, lists are a feature that's only available in the Android app, not the iOS app yet. Um, and you can add an item to a list very easily if the list already exists, but it's very complicated to create a list. So they wished for that to be more streamlined. And of course, to add it to iOS as well at some point. They also really wanted to be able to pay their fines through the app. Um, and, they, and the college age students in particular wanted to be able to filter um, the search results by publication date and genre. Um, right now, uh, and I'm not sure if this is available on the uh, generic app or if it's just on the Pines customization, but we link out to the full catalog in several places or to the My Account screens for functionality that's not available natively in the app. And whenever we link out, they want to be notified that, um, that they're leaving the app and going to the catalog so that they understand because some of them had trouble getting back because they didn't understand they'd actually left. Also on the renewal page on the iOS app, um, the, they found the renew button hard to distinguish from the other buttons on the page. And um, a lot uh, of the user group uh, members also requested some sort of in-app tutorial. Um, you know, something simple and mobile friendly, but, you know, possibly popping open a few simple like single screen tips when opening the app for the first time where you could swipe through a few or cancel out of them and then also making them available from the menu. And that is my part of the section. So I'll turn it over to Tiffany. And now it's my turn to see if I can share my screen. Oops. Okay. Um, so, so going forward, after we have all this feedback from the students and their presentations and um, the people who participated in the studies, um, now that we have gotten all of that together, we'll be adding all of this to um, Launchpad and creating bugs the same way that we did with the accessibility study. Um, so, and probably they'll usually fall into um, either the usability bucket um, for tags or accessibility because um, some of them were usability things and some of them were accessibility, like where the pop-ups show on the screen, um, how that was a was an issue for people who wear bifocals. Um, so, so we'll be going through and adding all of those to Launchpad um, uh, from what we've gleaned from this round of testing. Um, but actually, um, that group at Mercer, um, there is obviously a new class every semester, 
And um, when we spoke with Pam, they do this same project every semester or every year. And so they always need someone to test on. Now they often test on um, uh, other uh, uh, like government departments, um, but they said they would be willing to work with us again. So that would be really useful for us because we can take what they've given us now and make improvements and then test again. So we can do uh, like an iterative uh, like development. So we can test on those same groups, see if it's better. And then we also didn't really um, focus on sort of that middle group demographic. So we did high school, college, and then we did the over 65 group, but we didn't really get the that big in between group. So um, that would also be a future thing that we could test on there and see if they also have the same concerns um, that the other groups did, or if they have a completely different set of expectations and concerns and needs. So, um, so those would be our two, uh, two going forward pieces is adding to Launchpad, so things that we already um, uh, can, can fix. And some of those are wish lists, like the, like the map integration, um, and some of those would be bugs, like the pop-up. So, um, and then just testing over again, as far as Pam and her students will have us, um, so that we can keep uh, that ball rolling forward um, and keep testing with it. So those would be our steps going forward. And then we also have the, um, the slides from the student presentations that the, the students did. Um, and so you can click on this link and you'll actually be able to see the presentations that the students did. So, and does anybody have any questions? My portion is really short and sweet. <laughs> um, I'm just reviewing the um, chat. Um, someone asked if, uh, Stuart asked if the code for the app is available. It is publicly available. It's all following open source protocols and um, and I'm sure Ken would be delighted if someone else besides him was contributing to the code <laughs> um, so that, it, he, so that uh, we were all relying on him uh, in his spare time to work on this. Um, and Ken has posted the location in GitHub of where that uh, code lives. Um, did anybody else have any questions? Um, I wanted to notice if you're not watching chat, I uh, wanted to point out that um, Ken will be hosting one of the breakout rooms in the virtual happy hour. Uh, I think that's tomorrow. Um, is that tomorrow, Ken? Yeah, tomorrow, 5.15. All are welcome. <laughs> okay. Um, so if anybody has any questions, either if, whether you're using the app already or if you're just interested in using it. Uh, our users in Pines absolutely love it. Um, it's being used by all age groups that are comfortable with smart, uh, smartphones. And um, even a lot of staff prefer using it for their own holds and everything. And the search especially is incredibly fast. So we're very delighted with it. Oh, I wanted to add, I didn't add it on my slide, um, but if you're interested in something like this, like going through university, so um, for Mercer, it was the engineering department, but I also like did some Googling. And so you can look at your local university for human computer interaction classes or courses. And a lot of them do the same thing. So if you're interested in having your, you know, your branded Evergreen looked at or even just your website or whatever. So they may or may not do it. I'm not putting anyone on the spot, but if you wanted to see if that was a possibility then. Um, that might be a keyword you could look for. Well, and uh, Diane's asked about the survey questions. Um, the the slides, sh the students had the questions for each one of their um, um, study groups. So they go into that, into their, uh, their presentation some. Um, and uh, they also have, there's, some of them have a couple of videos of people's reactions and all. But they talk about their setup for their uh, study and the things that they asked um, with each individual one of those sessions. Yeah, it was really it was really fun to go see their lab. Um, you know, it's all high tech, and they have the eye tracker, the camera.
have access to and and they have you know they record the people um so they you know visually and audio um audially so that audially i don't think that's the word um but they can um so that they can go back and review it you know to take more notes um you know they have a facilitator in the room and then the rest of the students are watching through a one-way glass so that they can all pay attention to how the um, users in the user group are reacting to the screens it's, it's really cool if anybody else gets a chance to do something like that i recommend it well and uh some of them they did remotely so they were uh filming through uh computer the computer and all and i do um this particular study part of the study was uh free because it was a student thing uh, i have a feeling that if we advance to more um advanced studies that we may have to cough up money but <laughs> you know there's there there is a possibility for that free uh as well oh you wanted to see the survey on the opac we perform annually oh um the the questions are actually on the um the handout like the you know the results it, it has the exact wording of the questions we don't have the um the free text we don't put the free text answers online because some of that has sensitive uh patron information and of course my phone rings too um i'm looking for the I'll, I'll post the link to where all of our user surveys are get published if i can remember where i put it there it is So that has all of our user survey uh, results going back to 2006. And we do try to keep uh, the questions the same from year to year uh, so that it's so that we can more reliably see the progress, um, you know, of you know, the reactions of people from year to year um, to gauge uh, whether the overall um, approval rating goes up or down. And um, the only thing that we've added, I think, is you know, as we've added some major new features, we might ask an additional question about that. Like I know we added the app question in whatever year we ro rolled that out. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? I just had has, one, oh, there you go. <laughs> I just had one one comment. It's interesting. Uh, all of this data is super interesting. So thank you for that, and thank you for sharing. Um, one thing you mentioned is that the renew button was a little bit hard to use in the OPAC, and that there is not a direct connection between the item checked out and the renew action. When when the app started, I did that because I thought it was the most obvious thing, and then I got feedback saying hey, I have 27 items checked out for my four children. I want to renew them all at once. So can you add check boxes? Yeah, I think, I think it's, you know, I wouldn't want to take away the current option because there are people like, especially homeschoolers and, you know, people that, uh, you know, just read a lot that do have 50 items checked out, which is our max uh, at all times. But, um, you know, I think for, for those people that don't have that many checked out, being able to do each one at a time is also nice. So they want everything. <laughs> they want it both ways. Um, Nicole, uh, yes, um, I believe I, I can, could talk to it more, but there is um, a general Hemlock app that I think Ken could just add a connection to your library system from. Um, but if you want a customized version, uh, Ken can do that as well. And the code is open source, so if anybody else understands the app development or you have access to another developer, they could also customize it for you. Okay, Tiffany and Elaine, did you have anything else you wanted to say? 
Uh, I just think it was a very good experience for us to both interact with these students. They were um, very professional and um, uh, very, um, very good to interact with. And it was very, very interesting to see the um, results of the survey, of the study, um, because I mean, when you think about it, we're all power users, okay? We, we know where everything is. We know um, how to navigate things. So we don't always see those blocks. I think we all in Pines were aware, for instance, that our massive list of libraries is gonna be a, um, a barrier to a lot of people. But just hearing some of the other things was surprising because um, we know how to use the software. And so it's extremely helpful to get that other perspective from people that, that don't know how to use their software. Yeah, I, I was actually gonna say the same thing. It was really interesting because when they were giving their presentations, you know, we're, we're scribbling down notes and I'm like, I never even thought of that. Cause just like Elaine said, we're kind of like the power users or we work on our computer all day long. So we're familiar with the browser or the app or whatever. And so it was, I just never thought of a certain thing that way. So it was really, um, it was fascinating and just, we took tons of notes. It was really, it was a really great experience. Well, I think, you know, I, I was reminded um, from my archeology span days, the, the adage that we used to do to go where the data takes you. Um, and it's really, really important to, to look at your data and, and go where it takes you because it can take you into unexpected places. And one of the things um, that they mentioned about the going, clicking on a button and en ending up in a totally different place and not knowing how to get back. Um, uh, those kind of things are just, they're self-evident to us. Uh, but it's clear that it's not self-evidence to everybody that uses it. And, you know, even though I did have a lot of slides there on problem areas, <laughs> they were actually all pretty happy with it for the most part. There were just like certain clunky things that, that we could uh, consider streamlining. Uh, Chris Burton uh, had mentioned in chat, uh, you know, he's working on revamping the um, OPAC to make it more user-friendly and uh, accessible and responsive. And so he's interested in taking some of these OPAC or some of these suggestions and integrating those as well there. So I think the pop-ups especially, that's, you know, one that should be pretty easy, I, you know, presumably um, for the browsers uh, to customize those pop-ups and that would make a huge difference to quite a few people. And the hold placement page too, I think. You know, I've always thought it was clunky, but I never really sat down and looked at it to see how we could make it better. I think uh, one of the things we were talking the other day is we need to have an authority file for our library names. Uh, <laughs> because so many of them, people may know their local library, you know, is the whatever county library, but it's actually named by someone they've never about named for someone that they've never even heard of. So they can't find their library in the list. Um, the, um, Chris, our slides will be available, um, uh, we'll get them posted uh, to the um, presentation site, I believe, um, um, and um, also linked on the last page of the presentation is a link to the original student presentations, so you'll have both of those. Um, and. Um, there's actually only four of the five student presentations there. Um, one of them it doesn't look like we ever got. So I've asked the instructor to look for that. Um, she's out of town right now. So hopefully by next week, she'll get the other one as well. So it's the um, Android app one that we're missing. Um, so we did have a lot of notes on it, but we didn't have the actual student slides. Uh, yeah, and Andrea says that uh, the slides will be linked uh, from the conference webpage. I think, Lynn, um, there was a question for you actually in chat. We were curious about how your rollout process has been. So if you want to, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, 
sent the message. It's been great. We're currently in the beta, beta, beta test phase. Um, everybody who has who's beta testing the app is loving it. Um, yes, there have been a couple of things that yes, we would love to have certain things done, but um, for the most part, um, everybody who has tested the app so far has loved it. Um, hopefully, by the end of the month, we're rolling it out again, right? Um, I think Never that's what, <laughs> uh, but one of the things that everybody has asked about um, is um, putting self-check in there, how we could integrate self-check into the app. And I know uh, there was another consortium that was also looking at adding self-check into the app. Yeah, that's such an interesting idea, and I would love to know more about how libraries plan to use it. Um, I have a feeling our libraries would would resist it, um, uh, just because they think people are just going to walk out the door with everything. Not that there's a lot stopping them right now, anyway. Um, but uh, but I yeah, I'm very curious about how that will work. Um, uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is Ken is actually wor working on pulling the library information into the app as well. Right now, there'll be a library info button on the main screen. Um, we're beta testing it here in Pines right now um, so that they can click on that and see the info for their home library, the hours and um, address and phone number and, and email and stuff uh, to make it easier for them. And then it'll default to their home library and then it will um, it has a drop down too, so they can select a different library if they want to see the, that library's hours and contact info. And just so you know, Ken, everybody that's tested so far loves it. <laughs> no problems yet. <laughs> that's great. I didn't really realize that there were 12 pages of library branch listing. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah. And you know, once, once the, um, once the project uh, that um, the ECDI is funding right now to be able to sort copies by the closest location is there, um, that will start pulling at the library, um, the uh, library coordinates in. So at least that information will be in the database at that point associated with the libraries. So that'll be a, a you know, that's a crucial piece of data that will need in order to move forward. Very cool. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? Oh, yeah, um, Jennifer Pringle. Um, says that they're looking at self-check app options too to reduce having to clean the self-check computers all day long every day, which is a very good point. Okay, well, if there's no other questions, um, then I think we can wrap this up and everybody can take a little break before the next session starts. All right, so we're gonna just keep this session alive. I'll uh, put up a slide. Coming up next at three o'clock, we'll have the Student Success Working Group